the primary thing that I learned a lot from working in tech and the internet industry in general is that not all decision matters. Actually, most decisions are reversible. That's probably it. Like before I joined like a core man or tech industry, I'm a super indecisive person. Like, I don't know, should I do this, should I do that? Well, I'm just like analysis paralysis for uh, for a long time. You're just, looking for the correct decision. Yes, exactly. You're looking for the correct decision. And tech is more just try stuff. Yes. So the startup world is more like just try stuff. Welcome to the Pathless Path podcast. Today, I am talking to good friend Jovian Gotama. He is a fellow friend I have known here in Taipei for multiple years, and he comes from Indonesia, but he spent most of his adult life in Taiwan and is also a citizen of the very American-influenced internet. We're going to talk about his journey of going from Indonesia, studying tourism, to selling steel in Kaohsiung, Taiwan, to now he is the CEO of a podcast app, my favorite podcast app, Castro, and how he navigated his career, how he thinks about life. I think you have a really interesting perspective. Excited to dive in today. Super exciting um, to join the podcast, Paul, and the um, the. Paul Miller experience. You're like the Joe Rogan of like people who hates nine to five jobs, you know? And yeah, really nice to be here. And yeah, super excited. That's a, uh, wow, that, that's a nice compliment. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, Paul pilled. It's not red pilled anymore. <laughs> what, uh, what were you like as a kid? Um, so when I was a kid, it's, it came from a quite complicated family background, I'll say. Um, growing up, I was basically like, treated like a prince, which is really interesting. And did you give you an um, a paint like a painting like how absurd it is? Like, I am still fed spoon fed by like third grade because that's how um, how say that's how spoiled I am, and that's not necessarily because I want to, because just like my mom was kind of like. Um, treat me that way and um but then but then growing up it's kind of like a messy and complicated um family life and um yeah in a way it, it kind of feel detached but it kind of feel doesn't fit in with um who i am like this family so i kind of like grow up i kind of raised myself a bit and with the um the influence of friends around me trying to fit in um and yeah, it's as a growing up, I will say I was quite independent, but there's always feel this like I don't belong here um, feeling growing up. Say more about that. What What do you mean you didn't quite fit in? Maybe maybe a little more about your family background. Wh what was the the culture your parents are coming from? What, what was their background? Right. Um, my parents they never actually had a nine to five job, so. I would say they do kind of like scattered jobs here and there. Sometimes they start some entrepreneurial stuff and selling stuff. And, but none of them really pan out to be like a long-term thing. And it's just like, um, I would say money is not a concern, so to speak, but it's most a concern for survival. There is no pressure of like, oh, you have to be a rich person. Or something like there's this Asian, you know, kind of pressure. Oh, you have to take care of your family or your parents when you grow up. It's always there. But I would say it's come from non-traditional um, background, even in the um, even in the Indonesian society, like you know, uh, in a broken home family, and growing up. Um, yeah, so it's it's just really all over the place so to speak that's the only way i can describe it and of course it's in the middle there's a lot of family drama kind of thing like like some jail time involved like not me personally but it's kind of like impacted my um childhood like uh growing up so very like 
not even working class, just sort of like having to make ends meet, doing yeah. whatever it takes, survival mode. I would say lower middle working class. Yeah. The way I kind of describe it to is like um, where we don't have internet growing up at home and we don't have any personal computer or laptop because it's too expensive. But we also didn't need to worry about what to eat for tomorrow. So we still yeah. have that kind of like uh, buffer economically, so to speak. Awesome. So this combination of like needing to make it, um, maybe a little scarcity mindset, but also you were, like we were talking about this at lunch mm -hmm. before this, you, you were like very praised. Like yeah. you, you have a tremendous amount of self-confidence for yes. as an adult, as I yes. can tell now. Right. And um, it, it seems like you weren't criticized much in your childhood. Yeah, so when I grew up, like I mentioned before, I was super spoiled. Like I cannot do no wrong most of the time, like in my parents' eyes or my family's eyes. Were you the only child? or I am the only child. So, you, yeah. okay, yeah. So is... it kind of explains everything, right? So... Yeah, so it was growing up, it's always this positive uh, encouragement, or positive reinforcement kind of thing. So I was never, um, I heard from, uh, I was, we all talk about this after, online, it's like I never get beaten by my family, which is, I know in the US, it's probably like super, like super awful, like beating, but like on, on our age, like in Asia, like yeah, beating your kids common. is just like staple food, right? Like I've told you, like I'm, I feel absurd because I'm the only kid not beaten in my class. Like, why, why don't you beat me? <laughs> kind of thing, right? So yeah, so there's always this positive encouragement, and positive reinforcement, which is like I think in hindsight it kind of built my confidence. But on the other hand, it in the beginning it also gave me like I have to build my own system to handle negative stuff or handle rejection and growing up because I wasn't equipped well uh, to do that. And so, yeah, and then in my adult life, whenever that kind of negative stuff happened, I didn't want to, like, to fall back to my family for um, either positive, positive reinforcements or actually, actually, let me rephrase that. So and as I grow up, whenever I had, like, a negative stuff coming in or a like, criticism, I don't have the place to get that kind of positive reinforcement because I kind of like didn't want to get involved with my family more. So I had to build that from scratch, honestly. Yeah. So take me to high school. You're working in, um, or you're going to this like very tourism focused right. school. Right. Um, how do you end up in Taiwan? So in high school, so that mindset was that. So uh, in Asia, it's like uh, junior high school and then high school, like uh, three years of junior high school and then three years of high school. So whenever I, when I graduated junior high school, there wasn't this idea of like going to college. There is nothing, college is not even in the roadmap. It's not even like I need to go to college. There's, not, there's nothing um, that came up. And uh, on my family, there's no, nobody went to college. So at that time, the idea was like, I wasn't even sure which high school was I uh, going to go to. And in Indonesia, or at least in Jakarta, like the best high school are usually private high schools. And they're super expensive. Like we absolutely couldn't afford it. My family couldn't afford it. And then one day there is this, um, I realized there's this option of vocational high school. It's just called, I think in the US you guys call it grade schools, right? Yeah. But it's more tourism focused, basically like, after you graduate from that school, like um, you can go work in travel agencies or uh, airlines, um, and so no, those are good jobs, right? Good jobs, like yeah, tourism, yeah. you can make really good money in Indonesia. Right, the basic salary is really is really low. You get it from like taking being like a tour leader, like you take a tour group abroad. Uh, I'll tell you what, my f so uh, I'm jumping around a bit here, but like after I graduated high school. I was waiting for a result of the time of uh, if I if I'm get, coming to Taiwan or not, right? So I got like a full time job, and my f basic full time salary this is like forty hours per week job salary was like I'm not kidding you. This is like hundred US dollars per month, and yeah, even the same currency, even the currency back is like hundred and hundred fifty US dollars. That's low paying job, 
but uh, yeah, and we like high school graduate. Yeah, so um, at that time, we didn't. I didn't have an idea. So that time, my idea was like, oh, I want to make money as quickly as possible, so I can get out and then kind of be independent from the family norm, something. And so I went to this um, tourism high school, and I think kind of there's some luck involved here because my high school had a scholarship program with a sister university in Taiwan, in Kaohsiung. I think so every year they chose a couple of um, students to apply. And then you get like full ride uh, from um, uh, dormitory fee, from tuition fee. For college. For college, yes. Yeah. So I was kind of lucky then. And Did a lot of people apply to that? No, actually, this is kind of it's kind of weird because at that time, not everyone can apply, and it's a really small school, by the way. Yeah. When I said small, is like on every year we had like sixty or seventy students for one year. And I imagine a lot of people just don't want to go to Taiwan. Yeah, and <laughs> I feel like there's also some. Um, so it's not offered to everyone, basically. Yeah. So they had master back then, so like kind of choose. Hey, do you want to apply? If you want to apply, then uh, we'll tell you how to do it. So it's not necessarily open to everyone. But yes, but at that time, I had that opportunity. And um, I was like, all right, why not? Because I think the mindset was kind of like, I want to kind of break free from the... From, I'm not necessarily from Indonesia, but like from the society. I'm curious about what um, what is out there, right? Because since I was a kid, I was very much influenced by... I consume a lot of Westerns like media stuff like pop culture like what like uh, MTV I love MTV like, like <laughs> TRL TRL not really this is MTV I guess you're a little younger than me <laughs> <laughs> I was like this MTV like MTV classics and I'm um, learning about, and then what stuff on MTV oh it's usually MTV Crips you oh, know that that's course. really good that's really good this was this um, so one, what what in like you see cribs and you see all these mansions in America? Like, yes, whoa. this whoa, it is Aaron Carter's house. <laughs> Rest in peace, Aaron. Um, so um, yeah, no, it's really more like it's a mix of. I had a TV in my room, and yeah. then it's just a cable, and then this I would just watch a lot of like Messer Media stuff, like HBO with subtitles, of course, Cartoon Network. It kind of happens there, and so um, watching like the Sopranos. So I didn't watch a Soprano song, but I this... watched Sex in the City. Like, I have no idea what was it about when I was a kid. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of... Um, Just so curi- kind of, curiosity yeah. about the world. Yeah, this curiosity about the world, which is especially about the English language, especially the, the Western language, yeah. if that makes sense. So I think overall, it's kind of like the... It's also laid back to... Laid back to oh, I think tourism would be good for me because I'm always somewhat good at uh, English subjects like growing up and I'm not sure why and it's just I have this intrinsic curiosity about the language and also video games because in Indonesia they don't translate um, English video games to Indonesian so you kind of figure out okay what the hell is happening in this video game especially when you play like RPG games right and then yeah sometimes I just play video game and then look at the dictionary or what does this mean what does this mean so so yeah and then Going back to high school, and it's, it's like a natural fit, like it's yeah. kind of built into that. And then I got the opportunity to um, the scholarship to Taiwan, and then I got accepted, and I was like, yeah, let's roll. <laughs> it's kind of like. <laughs> yeah, and so talk to me about coming to Taiwan. It, right. It's actually interesting what you were saying about Indonesia and mm-hmm. English. I find Indonesia way easier to navigate than Taiwan. Mm-hmm. Um Taiwan is sort of like closed off with the language, like stuff isn't translated to English as much. Um, how did you experience that at first? Yeah, uh, when you say experience, experience Taiwan? Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. So at first, I you, was... Did you speak Ch- Chinese? No, I, kn- I, I know you have some Chinese background, but you didn't speak I Chinese. I spoke on zero Chinese. Yeah. Um, so, oh, but it, so the scholarship also includes some like, Chinese courses. Yeah. It's like intensive Chinese courses. So... Um, when I first came to Taiwan, I, I feel like your experience might be different because you're, uh, I came at 33, yeah. <laughs> you came at 33 18. and then like you're, you're a uh, Caucasian or is that the proper term right now? I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't so know no, what no. the proper term is, 
But yeah, it, well, that's yeah. a very, that's a very like interesting thing in Taiwan, right? Your experience Absolutely. is totally different because people recognize you as Asian, and yes, sometimes they think you're Taiwanese. Yeah, and sometimes they assume you're Southeast Asian, right? Yes, yes. Um, versus how people treat a white person in Taiwan is, is different. Okay. And how like, to describe that? Let me ask you. <laughs> at, at, yeah. I I think it's it's sort of tied to what you were saying with the Western culture. Like, I think especially among, like, Taiwanese elites, people put white American culture on a pedestal, mm. right? And I didn't ask for that. It's a bit weird sometimes. Um, and in Asia, there's sort of, like, a hierarchy. People look down on Southeast Asians here. It's, yeah, it, it makes is. me very uncomfortable. Um, right. A lot of people's exposure to people from Indonesia are through uh, home health workers yep. and AIDS, right? And how people treat those people are not necessarily the best, right? So, yeah, all that for con how does that resonate with your own understanding? And um, so. In general, there is this I, I know there is this some kind of like condescending view. I don't think it's that bad actually, but there are some uh, to uh, non Singapore, non Singaporean, non Malaysian, um, Southeast Asian. Like so, in Asia, like I mentioned, like a lot of um, for those who are not uh, familiar with how it works, is that a lot of uh, in Taiwan there's a lot of foreign workers that becomes home helpers, but they're usually not Taiwanese. They're usually f migrant workers from Indonesia or uh, Philippines and uh, Thailand. So they work here, work in the factory, doing the like, um, I won't say dirty work. How, how would you say that? Like, um, uh, like factory work. Um, so there is this some kind of stereotype if you come from that country and you're probably more like a lower class citizen and again i have to clarify it's not everyone thinks like thinks about this this way but maybe for like elder person um but i'm actually quite lucky because um i came to taiwan in a college environment right so a lot of my uh seniors are which is, who are also from indonesia are help or super helpful oh, that's and great. they already speak chinese really well so um, I I was kind of you know uh, it was it was it was lucky. So when I come to Taiwan, the I don't need to adapt a lot by myself. Um, so there are people who are assisting me, and usually like college kids at that time, my college friends, they're super uh, super friendly. So um, so yeah, but in usual I. In general, probably speak a still Asian culture, so I don't have a lot of this, you know, um, culture shock. Like for example, the food. Oh yeah, it's like Asian food. Like at least that's how I see it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, but I think it kind of, I kind of like it. everything is more less messy here, and then it compared to back home in Indonesia. So I kind of enjoyed it. So not yeah. a lot of negative culture shock. Yeah, and so. You you've talked before about how you sort of liked the rules, mm -hmm. right? And this is why you had, you didn't have a single person you knew growing up that had a nine to five job or an office job. It's completely opposite of my experience. Um, so you were sort of like craving some of that structure, some of the predictability. Um, talk to me about that and how you were thinking about like finding jobs and thinking about your career. So, Right after high school, um, before the scholarship thing, and when I was in high school, the thing was like, I'm, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to get a job. I'm work. I'm going to work in a travel agency. I'm going to, going to make my way up into um, a general manager or something. So in my family, there's almost a lack of structure of, what, yeah, just do whatever you want kind of thing. And, but, and I kind of crave that. Like I need, in a way, I need people to, tell me what to do. I need a mentor. I think the, the one way to think about it is like, I need a mentor to like guide me. Like um, every, like my father uh, come and goes back then. And like, I, don't, I didn't have like a father figure or even um, sometimes a mother figure to lead me through uh, 
to ease me to uh, see how the world works. So I'm kind of craving some structure. Um, so I'm kind of craving some structure, and that's why I, I think why Taiwan kind of suits me because there's some like there's rules. A lot of there's here. a lot of structure <laughs> here, and I think in Indonesia there's there are structures, but like people are more willing to break it. And but yes, in Taiwan there's a lot of structure, and I feel like there's a lot of uh, constraints, and which I can limit myself to in the positive ways, so to speak. So. I kind of um, how's it? So I kind of like that. So I kind of like that. And then, but the interesting part is when I graduated from university, and I realized these kind of structures can also be suffocating, right? Especially yeah. some stuff that like, oh, you know, this can be done faster this way. But why are we tied to this? Rules or what the boss says when I have a better idea. So, kind of realize that, and then I think right now, whenever I'm looking for an opportunity or a job, when I was looking, it's really more like okay, how do I? Um, so I kind of know how to identify an opportunity where there are some uh, rules and constraints, but also. I can identify when the rules can be uh, can be challenged or mend, yeah, like that. So I think it's really important. I think people don't realize that a lot of rules at at their job can actually be discussed, and their bosses or managers are actually open to it. So we're gonna get to that. I want to start with selling steel. <laughs> Dang, this hard hard hitting question in the podcast. Uh, I wasn't ready for that. You, uh, so, but that's one of your first jobs out of school, right? That is my first, um, yeah, technically second job uh, after an university. Uh, sorry, first job, sorry, first job out of university, second job after yeah. high school, yeah. So you're selling steel in Chinese. Um, what what were you feeling at the time? You're, out, you're on a call selling steel to somebody in China. Um, what is going through your day-to-day -day thoughts in, in that time? So on the selling part, I actually still use English because I'm selling steel nice. like internationally. Ah, okay. So to Russia and to uh, Indonesia and Ukraine. Um, so I use English cold, cold, doing cold calls in English. So it's, it's still scary, but it's kind of fine. Which is funny because I was more scared doing cold calls in Indonesia in my own ah. mother tongue compared to English. But Wait, I think that's an interesting point. It, I... I totally get this too. I think some things feel a lot heavier for me in English when I'm in the U.S. because I know exactly how I'm supposed to feel. I know exactly what you're supposed to do. I know what responses mean. When you're in another language, you're almost like un. Like when I'm communicating in Chinese, I'm not really sure what's going on sometimes, <laughs> but like right. I'm doing, I'm trying, and like getting through it. Yeah, I think that's correct because when I'm. So talking to people in Indonesia, I'm like super sensitive. What if they say something wrong? Yeah, you know I, the correct way exactly. to communicate. Exactly. Like, oh, we don't talk like this, you know. <laughs> so, but in English, I think I kind of like, okay, whatever. And the, the, the thing I think about, like, the people I'm talking about is also non native English speakers, yeah, so like true. Russians. So it's kind of like, but go back to your point about using Chinese, is actually we speak Chinese in the office. And when I need to speak, like write an email to supplier, it's in Chinese. It's really challenging because it's kind of Google really Translate related. was not as good then. Google Translate is not as good. And like, <laughs> how do you write business emails in Chinese? Like, and most if I if I talk to myself, like when I was like ten years old, hey, you're gonna write business emails in Chinese. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Can I swear in your podcast? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, so it was kind of. I would say it is. Um, like at that time, I sp I speak fluent Chinese. Yeah. So it's not that hard to communicate. Like. But your career, stuff. did you see yourself as a steel a steel salesman at fifty years Absolutely old? Absolutely not. So that's a very, that's a very interesting point that I was going to talk to. So, I think I went there for two. Stayed there for two years, and there's this weird, um, urge. At that time, I didn't know how to describe it. Like. It's almost like borderline depression kind of thing. It's just more like I do the same thing like over and over and over again. So for people who are not really familiar, basically like a steel trading company. So what you do 
is you find new clients abroad doing cold calls or uh, via emails or joining like a trade show. And then you build a relationship with them. And then every month or so you ask, hey, do you need any commodities? Do you need any stuff? And then we report the price to you. There's absolutely almost zero room for uh, creativity there. And I was like, I kind of was kind of like stuck there, but I didn't really know where to go because I, I didn't know what I'm good at at that time. Like I didn't even know that tech or internet stuff is a thing. Like I really don't know because I'm just... I was at that time I was like, oh, I can do sales. I know how to sell. And I speak English and then my job will be like international sales. Um so at that time I was kind of lucky again. So I met a client who was selling steel in Indonesia and he's is now one of my best friends. So he was running his dad's steel company, but on the side he wants to do some startup tech startup stuff with his friends. And I was like, uh, he's a really funny guy. And I'm kind of like, so what is this tech startup? And he started like explaining to me about uh, what a startup is and why he's interested in that. I was like, huh, that's interesting. And I basically got super invested to that. And I, this is at the same time around, you know, the, the Google um, Go competition, the the one who deep mind the, where oh, yeah, Google yeah. against the Korean Go player. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, oh technology is actually cool. So yeah. that was kind of like my mindset. So I would start started looking for jobs for um, startup in time. And At what this, year was this? This like twenty sixteen. Okay. Thing twenty sixteen. Yeah, and what what were some of the first on ramps in terms of learning more around tech and stuff? That's a very good question, my friend. This is like trial by fire, honestly. So. At that time, I didn't have zero knowledge about tech or how startups work or anything, honestly, or like programming language and whatnot. I just uh, applied to this job uh, and this called the company called Code Mentor, which is basically like one on one platform for people who want to find uh, mentors for programming. And they're looking for a bis- business development person. And I was like, all right, I don't have any guy experience. I, I only have two things that it's going my like, and actually only one. Like I, I, I know English. Like I can't speak English. Like at this, at this um, job, it was kind of like vague job. Kind of like they they think they need a business development person, but they don't really, they're not really sure what to do with this person. If that makes sense, they just want to grow. Um, so I applied. So I applied and uh, talked to the CEO, uh, Wei Ting Liu. Um, and yeah, I got accepted, which also nerfed something that you mentioned about like how, how I'm very like, I know a lot of Amer- more American things than Americans. I talked to my Xbox at that time. And I think the one thing that he mentioned to me that made me got a job is I mentioned to, to, to him the fact that I browse Reddit a lot. You what? I browse, I browse uh, oh, Reddit, Reddit. Yeah. Reddit a lot. Yeah, and he thought that it's really hard to find this kind of people in Taiwan. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I was like, "All right, thank you, Reddit." Well, I think that that's such an interesting point because in Taiwan, there's so much pressure on young people to speak English, right? But they're going to these cram schools that are teaching like textbook English, like speak it correctly, right? And that actually probably doesn't matter that much. It. Especially in the U.S. and in many places, like if your English can be like crappy, but if you know how to like navigate ideas and things like this, that can almost be more valuable. And it seems like that was one of your strengths you had developed pretty early on. Yeah, and honestly, I'm not sure where that come from. I think there's it's a lot of like um, I think it's a lot of absorbing a lot of American pop culture stuff. Honestly. So, this is what your guys are good at. <laughs> yeah, we put out a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, not all good. Movie, like movies, TV shows. Um, were there other strong influences for you? TV shows, movies, tech, like influencers you were following, podcasts. No, at that time I didn't. I think at that early time I was like. Um, I think when I was in college, like on the first year in Taiwan. That's kind of like the first year I got like unlimited access to internet. Like I mentioned to you, I didn't have internet in my house until like high school. 
and I think I got it on my third year finally. But it's like super super slow. Like you almost cannot load YouTube. Yeah. There. I think this is something people totally underestimate. Is how early we are in terms of onboarding people onto the internet. Hmm. Right. Like how many of your peers you grew up with now are like engaged in technology in that whole world? Oh, I would say not a lot, actually. Yeah, yeah not a lot. But I bet if you go to like 10-year-olds now, it's probably pretty yes. profound. Because in Indonesia now, you can get 4G everywhere. Yes, yes, that's exactly least. it. Yeah, yeah. I. It's a I, pretty dramatic transformation in the last 10 years. I remember you told me about the story when you went to high school. And yeah. then you list out jobs like Uber driver and YouTuber. And then you ask the students, like, what are the similarities yeah. between all these jobs? And then basically you said that these jobs didn't exist like 10 years ago. Yeah, they didn't exist when I graduated college. Yeah. College. College, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Like, I don't think people really internalize this. Like, podcaster, podcast producer, right, as a job. 10 years ago, maybe there were five people on the planet doing that. 2013, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe five people on the planet doing that. Mm -hmm. There are people doing that all over the world now mm -hmm. and like actually supporting their families. Right. So how do you navigate school in terms of like aiming at things, right? In the past, you could aim at certain behaviors, like put your head down and trust that you're going to be okay. That works if the labor market actually can deliver on that. Right. And I, I think this is um, I'm really interested in your story because you're so good at being agile and adaptive. Mm -hmm. And we're coming from an era when it was like you need to learn how to behave. When to an era where it's almost like you need to learn how to think and evolve. Yeah. Right. And it's actually not the same. Like in I think living in Taiwan on and off for the past five years has really given me a unique perspective. It's like Americans are in such a bubble. They think like full high paid full time jobs are like a birthright. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, just like get a job. Like why wouldn't you get a job and like everything will be great. You'll Do become... you feel like this is also true for people your age or this more like a boomer yeah, thing? Yeah, most people I know have full time jobs. Mm -hmm. um, we might seem like everyone's an entrepreneur in the U.S. from abroad, but it's not really the case. But in Taiwan, right, if you're just like put your head down, get an average job, that might be a terrible strategy, hmm. yeah. right? Because you're not in the U.S. economy, which is the top economy, extracting all the wealth from the global economy. Like you're in this middle income country where wages are kind of stagnant hmm. for 10, 15, 20 years now. Right. And it's um, if you stayed at that steel job, you'd probably make you wouldn't probably be making much more than you were making. What were you making yeah. at the time? And the steel job? Yeah. I was like 30,000 NTD, which was around like. It's like 900 US a month. 900 US, yes. Yeah. 900 US a month. So, that, oh, that's real low when I think about it. Yeah. So, but yes. Um, I think in Taiwan, come back to you mentioned about like um, learning how to think. I don't know. I, I think as I grew up, when I got more, when I had the, the time to consume more stuff from the internet, looking back, uh, sorry, at that time, it's, it feels kind of a bit like time wasting. Like, why do you spend hours on YouTube just looking stuff and then, or like spend hours on Facebook? Um, but I think at that time, it actually built my taste in terms of like what I found cool and what I want to work on or I want to be involved in. And as I'm joining tech and I realized, oh, yeah, this is kind of this is what interests me. And then the fact that the tech industry or even the in any jobs related to internet or the creative economy in general gives you a lot of um, uh, a lot of space to do creative stuff and just to do things that uh, you like is really liberating, um, at least for me at the time. And I think in Taiwan, I'm not really sure 
about like how to th- I think people like younger people or people uh, our age right like getting more and more uh, they they understand more that oh um in the internet is powerful the tech industry is powerful but how i see from the outside they are still bind by this like top to bottom like structure even of, even of the uh, taiwanese culture of the taiwanese culture um yeah or even like youtubers for example a lot of famous youtubers are actually under a company oh wow yeah this is i might be off on this but as far as i know they're like um like production agencies and whatnot which is probably not that weird in the us but yeah there's still like top to bottom um structure it still kind of exists here that kind of flavor interesting yeah i i think i i saw some of this like i was talking to some creators angie was friends with and they were like doing a course but like they were doing a deal with a platform and they were only going to get like 20 or 30 percent of the revenue i was like this is crazy like why wouldn't they just use white label platform and i think the those are becoming more powerful but i think um yeah, we're we're very constrained by our scripts, right? And this is in the U.S. too. People are looking for permission, right? And I think you've been really good at not waiting for permission. So talk to me about working at Code Mentor and then like what are some of the moves you made from there? So you went from Code Mentor, like you've had so many interesting jobs in the last seven years since starting at Code Mentor. Right. How did working in tech start changing your perspective on your life and how to take action in the world? One thing, I think one the, the, the primary thing that I learned a lot from working in tech and the internet industry in general is that um, not all decision matters. Like if you, all decisions, actually most decisions are reversible. That's probably it. Like before I joined like a core man or tech industry, I'm a super indecisive person. Like, I don't know, should I do this, should I do that? Well, I'm just like analysis paralysis for uh, for a long time. You were looking for the correct decision. Yes, exactly. You're looking for the correct decision. And tech is more just try stuff. Yes. So the startup world is more like just try stuff. And I was kind of like, oh, just test stuff and try stuff. You know, if it doesn't work, it's fine. It's just like a small, it's a small thing. So kind of changed my perspective a lot, also in life. And it's kind of seeping into my personal life too. Well, these things, okay, what happened if I do this? Uh, what's the worst can happen? So that's kind of changed my life uh, in general. And the second thing is that the people in the world are more connected than I thought it was. Like, for example, when I was in Co-Mentor, one of the... Um, one of the uh, first thing we do, I did like business development for the new platform at that time, basically like connecting freelance developers with clients. And I had like sales calls at 2 a.m. Taiwan time with American clients. And I think for some reason, it just like, oh, these are the untouchable like company or people like cool startups in the Bay Area and whatnot, but I'm in a call with them right now. So I think in my mind, it's like, well, every everyone is reachable. Everything is doable. And we are more connected in, in ways that I um, very, um, I'm very surprised. And I do like stuff like cold email campaigns. Like people reply to my cold emails. Like you're the CEO of like a Series C round company. Like, and I was like, oh, yeah, we are more, way more interconnected than I thought we are. And it's kind of like, snap like something snap clicked in my mind at that so you, time. you felt more of like a globally connected world yes yes it were a globally connected world and there is this i had this idea about creating a podcast or a newsletter about like tech workers in asia but it doesn't feel right when i think about it because i feel like we are like connected you know, even though yeah. you're in Asia or something like that. Does it make sense? Yeah, well, I think you see yourself as part of the global world. Yeah, that's how I see it. Honestly. Right? Whereas a lot of people see themselves as part of a country's labor yes. economy. Yeah. I think in the U.S., you tend to see yourself as part of the global world. Every company I worked for had a global team. Um, but, but for me, it's really more like identity, more like yeah. self-identity kind of thing, like, uh, I know. I, I love it, Taiwan. I mean, you just—is it you just found more of a home on the internet? And um, 
I think I won't say found more of a home, but I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Yeah. I'm comfortable with like reaching out to people on Twitter, reaching out to people on email or DM. And I've kind of know like, um, I kind of know like how to get my way through it. Like, yeah. Well, yeah, I know. How, how do you make life easier for that? How do you make friends on the internet? That's a really good question. Um, for you, you reach out to me. I, I don't know. You reach out to me on my personal website. But I think in the internet, I think Twitter is actually still an underrated, or X right now, whatever you call it, is still an underrated platform to uh, make friends. Another thing we've talked about is how we are both like a very optimistic person yeah. and a uh, naturally optimistic person. I think it also seeps to me in how I see people like in the internet. Like it's uh, always about, I think most people are good. Most people are nice. So if I reach out to them, they'd probably be nice to me. So yeah, yeah, kind of thing. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is something I think too. It's like, yeah, yeah people probably want to hang out. Yeah. <laughs> And then it sort of is like virtuous cycle because yeah. if you think that, then like people are like, oh, he seems pretty cool too. Yeah. And like it actually leads to. Well, why wouldn't you want to hang out with me? I'm a great person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even, Yeah, I don't even know if it's like an ego thing. For me, it's sort of like a naive optimism. Right. It's like, of course, everyone will get along. And like I generally like a wide range of people. I think you're very similar. You yeah. could probably have a conversation with anyone. Yeah, I was like, I think making friends about making friends on the internet, like, um, it's really more about most people are nice. I think, yeah. of course, there are some assholes along the way, but if you filter it out, like, most people are good. Most people want to help you. I think that's what I found. I think, um, I think I, sometimes that's n not true. I of think course. sometimes in Taiwan, like, I've actually had some difficulty engaging in Taiwan where it's like, Offering like almost like English American internet world is like the assumption is you should help people. It's sort of this pro social frame of like you should help people. Hmm. When I've tried to do that a couple times in Taiwan, proactively offered stuff, hey, I'll come and like connect with your group and mentor. They're like, I heard through the back channels, somebody found Angie and they were like, we we felt bad like having him to have to come and do this interesting right it's like this burden of like oh we might have to owe him some or we might not be good enough and it's like there's all these hidden layers of friction i find in taiwan which is why like it's just easier to engage with people on the internet first the internet is almost like a filter for like people that are willing to engage well i'm very curious about that friction that you mentioned i never experienced it personally myself but i probably just never had um you know offer something up but I, I i'm super curious about that though i wonder if that's common or is it because mostly because you're a foreigner it could be yeah i don't i don't know i think um yeah, I, I mean, one time angie, angie was like embracing some of these principles one time she reached out for a fitness a head of a fitness course thing and there's like a fee it's like a very famous person and i think people are he's used to people um seeing him as an authority right and she was like oh could i volunteer doing this in exchange for this and he sent her back like a nasty email it's like how wow. how could you um think i i don't know the frame of it but it was very like condescending it was like this is silly. This is not something we would do, that kind of thing. Um, and so all you all you need to do is experience that once, and then you're sort of just like, eh, not worth yeah. engaging. Exactly. I think that's that's a, that's the thing, right? You got to try it stuff. You got to try yeah. it stuff and see if it works or not. And um, I think there's also something that I kind of learned in the tech industry too. You got to try it stuff. Or else you, you're kind of just assuming how people will react about this stuff you're doing. Yeah. And if it's the worst they can do is like say no. So I would say, so yeah. So how did you go from there to hosting a podcast about so, remote work? Yeah, I think this also relates to what I mentioned about a lot of things are negotiable even if you have a full-time job. So I was in Code Mentor. At that time, they had another product called Arc. 
and until until like for four years at that time, and I was kind of got in that stuck like oh man I'm kind of stuck I feel like I need to do something different, and at that time I was、um, discussing with my C with the CEO about like can I be part time. And can I do like part time job here instead of like full time because I want to spend the other half of my time to explore、um, different kinds of stuff. And first, first thing I know this is doable because、uh, the company had done before with other team members. And the second thing is that I know to get this approved, I needed to propose something. I need to propose a project. I think that's people. I we've talked about this, but I think. People don't think about how to make it when you discuss something or you want to propose something. You have to make it easier for the other parties to say yes and make their lives easier. So I think at that time my approach was okay. I'm going to、um, work part time, like two maximum three days a week. But okay, so I cannot work very closely with a full time team member. So what can I do, which is kind of independent? And it was a podcast, and at that time I was also like super curious about podcast. Like, how do you create a podcast, and what's the process? And I was fascinated by it. And I just okay, why do if you do remote work podcast? And at that time, remote work was like kind of like、uh, booming.、Uh, this before, this is pre COVID. It's still pretty early. It's super early, <laughs> and we, and then people was in twenty、like, eighteen, people were like. I talked、yeah. with some clients, and they were like, "Yeah, we just don't do remote stuff. You would need to be in the office." Yeah, yeah. Still have some of those people, but eventually, most of the boomers will retire. Yeah, I mean, they're like Fred Flintstones. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, so, so at that time, I proposed, "Okay, let me do this、uh, remote work po- remote work podcast," and、uh, I was okay. Let's do that, and then I just started. Like, I was the.、Uh, I learned everything from scratch, basically how to produce podcasts and how to do interview research, and I'm just reaching out to. So you're doing that for Code Mentor. Yeah. And so you did the the podcast and remote work. You were you proposed to them. You would do that instead of your job, and then. Yep. What was your plan to do with the other work on the side? This is very interesting. So, it's funny because the plan that I do instead was like I want to create something by myself, right? But then it led me to get another job. Yeah. So, at that time, I was like part time, and I was very I wasn't super involved. But I I found this, the indie hackers community, and at that time I was like, oh, I want to be an indie hacker, but I I can't code, and I don't really have an idea on how to do that. Okay, let's take take it step by step. The first thing that I want to do is like, okay, they have like this local meetups. And I think in London or Lisbon or something like that, and they they didn't have one in Taipei. Okay, and let me be your indie hackers ambassador, and let me just、uh, do a meetup. And then, and then when I started a meetup, I met a couple of indie hackers, some Taiwanese, some foreigners, and one of the attendees was、uh, Cameron, which、uh, is the founder of the fitness app Strong. So, and then we met there, and then I joined them full time. So. So that's one of it, and the other, the other, way, the other stuff. I just got start freelancing But stuff. Th- this is the crazy thing. This、What? kind of stuff happens to you all the time. Yeah. What do you think contributes to like these sort of opportunities sort of emerging for you all the time? Are you、uh, paying attention better than other people? Are you more likable than other people? I think it's just my looks, man. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know I don't. I think it's just like trying out new stuff. It's、yeah. like.、Uh, Do you think you're trying like ten times more stuff than most no, other people? Absolutely not. Absolutely not ten times. I think three、I'm, times. Two times. I, think. I really. <laughs> it's really just like, it's.、Uh, I think I like. I think it's a, the surface of luck, right? It's like the surface of luck. And just trying to new stuff, and then be there. And honestly, if I'm like objective, will say I think I'm quite good at conversations. I'm、yeah. quite good at like, giving a first impression that I'm, I'm likable. And this might change in like two months or so. But like I think it gives、um, a good first impression. And、um, I don't know. I think it's it's a、um, it's all of the education that from a child when I work in tourism high school, and.、Uh, 
Yeah, what do they to... teach you in tourism school? They, this is actually a lot of, um, it helps a lot. It's basically like, one of the reasons how is How to like, be likable is like Cialdini influence skills? More like how to handle customers, ah. how to handle clients. So one of the biggest in Indonesia, it, I, I don't think it, it's a lot in Taiwan, probably in Asia. So there's a job called tour leader. So it's not necessarily a tour guy, but you bring like a tour group abroad, like Europe for 14 days or Japan for like, eight days so just like 20 or 25 people group it's really so being a tour leader is a really uh tricky job it's kind of fun it's good for if you're extrovert extrovert people people has to like you and you have to be able to adapt and deal with random shit all the time and um and you need to learn how to say no without it sounding like you're saying no kind of like so this kind of um, there's a lot of emphasis on hospitality, how to be likable, how to win your customer's heart uh, at that time. Well, not necessarily selling, but just trying to be um, polite and to be likable in a sense. I think this is something that... Any specific things they teach you? Uh, that's a very good question. I think um, when... It's a very basic thing, but it's really more when you bring like... Um, a tour group, you need to anticipate what your uh, tour members might need afterward. Very small stuff. For example, when you go into uh, like a tourism spot, for example, you're in like Buckingham Palace or something like that. Yeah. First thing you do, go down the bus, find out where the restrooms are. That's it. Find out where the restrooms are. And then, so if you want to ask where the restroom, because that's an urgent thing, right? And then yeah. you know where is it. And then uh, real small stuff like table manners, um, and then sometimes how to deal with random situation, like this little one, um, one test that basically the, the question was like, okay, you're bringing a tour in Berlin. You're in Berlin, right? The Berlin airport. And one of your customers, uh, one of your team, uh, tour members lo lost their credit card. What do you do? Like, how ah. do you handle that kind of stuff? <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty interesting because it's. It's like this should almost be the sort of like role playing simulation yeah. type stuff this most people learn. Yeah. Like, because that's actual life skills. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and for example, another one is like if you go, let's say you bring a tour group to an airport and the airport is on strike right now, what do you do? What's the next step? <laughs> you're in, by step by you're step. in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Join the strike. And, and uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. Um, yeah, so, all right, so uh, you left your job. Were you concerned about money when you were thinking about renegotiating from five days a week down to two days I a week? I was, actually. I yeah. actually was. But this is how I'm, this is how I think about it. So at that time, um, I'm going to be transparent about numbers here. So my salary was like 60K uh, NTD. 60K 2000, like 1800 US 18, a month. Yeah, no, US a month, right. And when but I, in a country with universal health care and cheap food. Right, right. <laughs> but at that time, I, but I already have to, like, I don't want to go down in lifestyle. Uh, I yeah, cannot yeah. go down in lifestyle. This is like, <laughs> this is a Chris Rock bit about it. Like, people can't go down in lifestyle. But, so, but the idea thing is like this. So at that time, okay, it was around June. So it's like halfway through the year. And, okay, if I get, if, if, I go part time. I think I remember salary. you explaining yeah. it, right. this to me at the time. <laughs> I I think yeah, right. So, okay. So I think or actually it's not part time. Like two thirds of the time. So some sixty. My salary goes like forty. Yeah. Forty k. For three days a week. Yes. For That's three pretty days good week. deal. That's pretty good. And you then, just got a raise. Right. <laughs> That's true. That's <laughs> probably true. And then I was like, okay. So I'm thinking like, okay, to make my own. Um, to have the same lifestyle or, or income that I need to make the six months left in the year, right? So I need to make like 20K times six months, like 120K uh, total. Yeah. 120K NTD, that is just like 4,000 USD, 4,000 US dollars. And I thought to someone, I said, can I, can I, Jovian, make 4,000 USD in six months? Yeah. And I was like, that doesn't sound too bad. I think I can do it. Well, and, and 
I love that because so many people discover this when they become self-employed is yeah. you start thinking about money differently, right. right? And it's actually easier to make 4000 over six months if you're not working three days a week than if you work. Right. Yeah. Right? That's exactly so it this is. is where things start getting confusing because you shift from, I get paid for this hour of work to I might work for weeks and then get paid in three months from now. Mm. Um, which is a hard shift when people become self-employed. But once you start thinking that way, you start thinking about money totally different. Yeah, I think at that time, my it's also a mix of of like I was exposed to how people on the internet can make money at yeah. that time. Even so you're I just did... like browsing Twitter and people are like, I made $100,000. Yeah, <laughs> holy shit, this guy made 20K in MRR. <laughs> holy shit, Peter Levels make like 5 million US dollars, something like that. And it was kind of like, all right, it's kind of that kind of exposed, even though it's like indirect. And and then I was like, I kind of have some kind of confidence about my my skill level. And it's like, I can make this. So that's kind of like, give me a sense of comfort. And so you went from making about $1,800 mm-hmm. a month to then finding a job making 5000 a month. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. What What did that feel like? Did it feel like you tapped into some cheat code of <laughs> the world? Um, in a way, yes. But even before that, um, and to put this in context, five grand a month in Taiwan is that's not too bad. Amazing. Yeah. Right. You You can basically have like a really nice apartment for a thousand yeah. a month. I think that's, yeah, I think for me, it's it's a bit of a cheat code kind of thing, but it's really more like, oh, I can do this. And yeah. once you get that first thing, um, that first time, first opportunity, and uh, it feels like I can do anything. But actually just before that, I, before I found that full-time job, so that $5,000 to put into context is with my pre- previous job, um, full-time job. But before that full time, before that full time job, I had like freelance, uh, freelancing opportunities, and one of them was to be a podcast editor. With I've told you this with uh, Louis Grenier from Everyone Hates Everyone Marketing. Marketers and his friend Andrew Michael from Turnout FM. Um, it's interesting because uh, he's super nice because um, I listened to his podcast like even way before. I like how he thinks about marketing and stuff. And not being shady, not, not yeah. so much marketing bullshit. And I just actually just asked him opinions about marketing and stuff. And then he sent me like a long loom video about my questions and super nice. But I think that put me on his radar in a way. And after like literally I think a month after I proposed like the uh, the part-time thing, he reached out to me, hey, do you want to work as like podcast editor for me? Like we need someone to do this oh like oh right that's interesting and so sure, i did that po- editing podcasts and creating like uh blog content and uh so yeah so that's a, a kind of good paying job adding uh added to my um um part-time salary at that time so yes and then go from there i find a full-time job in strong and yeah it's it's really more about once you got this opportunity twice sorry once or twice it's just like it's unlocking cheat code. Oh, I can do this. Yeah, it's just opens like a new whole opportunities. And I think one interesting thing is you're tapping into the American like tech ecosystem, the hive mind, yeah. right? And like actually, like all that time, like quote unquote, wasted, mm-hmm. like watching silly TV shows, mm-hmm. was probably one of the most valuable things. You I will did. say yes. I'll say yes. Right? You, yeah. <laughs> you're like my most American friend in Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> like you Did drop... you just insult me? <laughs> no, you, it. you just drop some of the like deepest references. You're like, have you heard about this cafe? And like, <laughs> about this John Mulaney bits? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but it, it's very interesting because that is sort of what you need to... Like learning perfect by the book Grammar English is fine but actually like watching comedy and listening to podcasts is probably going to help you get a job more yeah and honestly and how many days have you spent in the u.s 30 days yeah yeah 
and it's like I think thirty days. So I went to the U.S. in twenty seventeen for like business trip, um, and mostly stayed in San Francisco, and the Bay Area and Sunnyvale to be exact, and went to L.A. to meet like high school friends. And I, honestly, I like the U.S. as at least at that part. I haven't been to other parts yet, but yes. So yeah, a lot of things I learned about the U.S. are mostly from like honestly like. Pop culture. I think even Americans don't really realize how big of an influence they have around the world just from the um, the entertainment stuff that they churn out like every day or like month, even before the influencer stuff. And I think I want to add like there's another side of this. I think there are a lot of people smarter than me that can communicate in English better than me, but they don't know that there are opportunities out there um, they can do remotely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you just start working for people too, right? right? And you just keep helping people. And I think it's like learning that behaviors. I, I'm guessing like your childhood experience was super valuable because like growing up, my experience was you needed to get accepted by a company to do work. Right. Your experience was you just do whatever you need to do. <laughs> yeah. I think that... Um... And, like, this is the crazy thing. We look at, like, people as, like, lower middle class or, like, poor people. It's, like, they're actually entrepreneurs. Yes. Right? The, the person selling food at a food stand or in a market, they're literally entrepreneurs. Yes. We just have all these class markers caught up in these things. Yeah, I think my child experience of being like a bit um like like off the beaten path actually and from that child experience and when I as I grew up I seek structure and constraints but as of now I feel like I calibrated it quite well like I know even though I know that I'm under a certain kind of structure or limitations I think there are some ways that can uh, circumvent that or negotiate it with the right person, like the street smarts kind of thing. I kind of learned that. So, so yeah, kind of lucky. <laughs> this is a great transition to um, you go from selling steel mm-hmm. to sales for Code Mentor mm-hmm. to running a podcast mm-hmm. to running marketing for Mm -hmm. a strength training app Mm -hmm. and then you become CEO of a podcast app. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Did did you expect you'd you'd have the title CEO at um, this age? Right. So, um, so (laughs) I don't know how to answer it. I think it's weird. I mean, honestly, like CEO is just really just like, you're, you're, I think you're downplaying it. Like I, I I understand it's a small team and it, yeah. it's not a major app, but you just end up in you keep and you you sort of just keep like wandering about trying stuff and just keep ending up like succeeding more. I'm and like more. the force gum for small startups, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like this. Yeah, I think I think yeah. force gum is great American <laughs> reference. <laughs> Shout out Tom Hanks. Um, to, no, no. Yeah, how, like, just how does that happen? So, so tell me actually how it happened okay. and um, so, talk to me about how that experience is Earlier gone. this year, this is 2023 for people who's listening in like 2067. Um, shout out from the past. <laughs> shout out to. <laughs> we don't have full AI yet. <laughs> shout out to President um, Joe Rogan. Um, um, so. I was transitioning to, I was looking at good, some new opportunities like earlier this year, right? So I I'm, I had like a, um, I had like some freelance gigs that I'm running with a Insight.com. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. Yeah. Insight, Insight is the uh, like tracking app with like no, blood. No, no, no. Insight is the um, like a news forum uh, website owned by Jason Calacanis. Okay. No, okay, I anyway, don't. so I had like a writing gig, like writing newsletters, like 
two newsletters a week. Imagine that. You were doing that as another side experiment? Side, another, another freelance gig. Like okay, so you've, you've done a bunch of freelance stuff. Right. You did some stuff for Zapier. You've right. written humor. Um, you, you're basically experimenting nonstop yeah. throughout this whole yeah. period. So at that time, I was just looking at different kind of uh, opportunities. Like at that time, I was, I'm not sure what I want, but I'm pretty sure what I don't want. So I know what I don't want in a job. And you wrote about this in your book, right? It's really important for you to have, like, to know what, understand what life you don't want. Anyway, so one of them is I bumped into uh, Tiny's uh, website. Uh, for those who don't know, Tiny.com is a holding company that owns the Castro podcast app along with uh, other companies like AeroPress and Letterboxd, actually. They, they, they own, acquired Letterboxd. They own AeroPress? Yeah. Nice. And and for designers out there, Dribble. So I... I'm I follow the CEOs like Andrew Wilkinson's Twitter for a long time now. I'm very interested about how they think about uh, managing small companies. Like it's not like 10x growth. It's just like they've radical approach. Yeah, just like profitable companies. Yes, the, oh, so man, radical. making money. <laughs> damn, this is like some anarchy is going on here. Like, look at this young kids want to make money. No, I always say like I've. I am so successful. I've made billions more than Uber. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. Of course, my income is a rounding error, but billions more. <laughs> hey, it's like morale victory for your yeah. wallet. Think about it. Like um, anyway, so, so Tiny is this holding company by Andrew Wilkinson. Mm -hmm. It owns a collection of profitable um, ventures. One of them is Castro. Um from what you've told me, it was kind of just running in the background, right. had a developer team, and uh, you ended up reaching out to work on it. Right. So this is another example that I think uh, might be interesting. It's an interesting story is like in Tiny's website, there's this form where if you want to work for, to on one of the, if you want to work for one of the portfolio companies, uh, you can fill out that form, right? And last question, like, where are you from? What are your interests? And which other company, uh, which other companies would you like to work at? And um, so I was filling it out. I was in Japan, like, having, like, a uh, career break at that time. And I filled it out. The submit button doesn't work. I think it's, like, a Webflow page, something like that. The submit button doesn't work. And so what I did was, like, I emailed Andrew <laughs> with my resume, with the subject line. Um, broken link on Tiny's website, and then I told him, "Hey Andrew, um, I was I um, I was using Tiny's website because I always want to um, submit my resume for any of Tiny company, but I realized that it, the link doesn't work. Just FYI. And by the way, this is my resume. This is my resume attached. And I think a couple of a week later, I think he replied, "Hey, do you want to work for Castro?" I was like, oh, sure. Did you say you want to work for Castro? No, no. But, like, that's one. I think the two companies that I'm super interested in working in, uh, in Tiny's, like, portfolio is, like, the first one is, like, Castro and Super Castro. And I'm not saying this because I'm not working in Castro. It's actually the one, the two that I had in my mind. Supercast is, uh, I think, one of the sister company that work with podcasts, podcast like Andrew yeah. Huberman, Peter Atia, And this generally was the one that I was, um, um, I'm thinking about when I was applying. So, yeah, and I was like, oh, sure. And then let me learn more about what is up. So. Castro user. Yes. For years. Shout For out. years. Shout out. So, will you link Castro on this podcast? Yeah. Absolutely. You're right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, anyway. So, I, at that time, I kind of learned, okay, that's interesting. And I learned more about Castro, about what's happening right now, and... And I used Castro like years ago, honestly, but I didn't use it recently. And I real and then I um I understand how it works, how different from other podcast app. And I was like, sure. But then I realized it's like CEO position. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa wait, 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 like CEO or general manager position. Like, wait, wait. At that time, my first thinking was it's not the positive way of thinking about it. Well, it kind of fits my experience. When yeah. I say it's not like the CEO thing fits my experience, but I'm very much I'm very much a generalist. Yeah. I, I I don't identify my I did marketing before, but it's weird for me to identify identify myself as a marketer. Yeah, you did a lot of stuff for strong yeah. and other 
companies. So, and then I was like, this kind of fits my interest and experience. Like I did a bit of design. I did a bit of um, like marketing and sales and stuff. This kind of fits my um, my skill set. I was like, okay, let's try it. We try it out for a trial period, a couple of months, and it works well. And yes, I think right now, as of now, I'm still running it. I don't know when will the podcast be launched. Like, so yeah, it's a really been an interesting experience so far because it's a great product. Let's say like the previous founders like. It's a really, really, really good product, and it's an opinionated, pro- opinionated product. Yeah, which is I like super, it. Like yeah. the queuing function is a killer feature yeah. for me, but yeah. I realize that may not be ideal for everyone. Right. Yeah. So I think for us, it's really more like just trying to figure out what's next and uh, update new features. But yes, that's how I'm in this position right now. <laughs> so. Um, I think a lot of these are this accumulation of pursuing things that I'm curious in, to be honest. Like, I'm not sure, like, I didn't know. I'm not sure why Andrew asked me, like, do you want to work for Castro? Like, what's in my resume? But in my resume, I mentioned that I had an iOS app experience with Strong, like the previous strength training app that I uh, I was working at. And I had a podcasting experience. So I, I know it's like a mash between those two. Yeah, this is the same thing about like aiming at a career. Right. Like huh. you couldn't have aimed at this when you graduated yeah, that's, college. Yeah, that's exactly it. So I'm very skeptical about the word career and successful and uh, right now. So, okay, when you say career, when you hear the word career, what, do you feel like it's, um, it's um, how to say it? Like, what do you think about it? I've thought a lot about this. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the Careerless Path by Paul Millard. Uh, I think about the definition as a first-person story in your head about how you relate to work over time, right? And when I think about it, I think about the past. I think about committing to a company in building a career, a series of narrative-driven steps, like, oh, I do this, and then I do this, and I accumulate this experience. Like, my first job was at GE. Mm -hmm. When senior people would come in, they'd be like, look, young people, this is what you need to do to succeed at GE. You need to work in these functions and these functions, and, like, the most important thing I, I did was, like, I took this hard role, I knew this role would suck and it would be hard and be long hours, but that's actually what you need to do to succeed at this company. So it's sort of like this whole story world people invent around like what you're supposed to do, right? And I think what's happened in the modern world is people are no longer with one company, right? So people are trying to pair career with jumping between companies, which puts the entire burden on the individual, to craft this story. And it's always fragmented, right? And I think like for me, the solution has just been to like actually disconnect from job to job to job to actually just trying a bunch of stuff. So now like a lot of the stuff I do like doesn't, might not make sense over a year, but like the principles are, I just want to be interested in the things and like stay energized. And yeah, I don't, which is a long answer, long way of saying I don't think about a career at all anymore. I don't think I have a career. Yeah, I mean, in a way, your book is kind of like the culmination of all your previous experience, right? That's like one milestone of... Yeah, your... it's it's also like a deprogramming guide for people that are in the career mindset. Huh. Um, yeah. yeah. And we crave this, like, consistent story, right? But in... It can be hard, right? Now you have the CEO title. It could be a trap to think like now you can only do that next, right? Yeah. I think how I think about it, even though I have the CEO title, but I'm really, I I mostly think about it is, I don't think about it in the frame of a career. As in, okay, if I'm CEO now, then I can be a CEO of a bigger company later on. I don't think about it like that. It's just really more about, okay, I'm in this position right now. 
what can I learn and what can I create or build with uh, the other people in the team, which can help me pursue future uh, opportunities that I'm curious about. Does it yeah. make sense? So just it's kind of like your curiosity. Yeah, alive just keep your curiosity time. alive. I, I think I'm I want to design this kind of thing and this kind of feature, and I mean, it can branch to something, but I don't think about it as um as um as a path to to a bigger cur title business title if that makes sense. I probably think about it as a way. How can ex I can expand my curiosity and try new stuff, but not necessarily how do I get like a bigger position yeah. and make more money. So, it's not necessarily a thing uh, like like that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think the trap of like aiming at success or like putting yourself in that career mindset is you see things as like I'm doing X for Y later. Yes. Right. And you're basically just saying I want to enjoy the X and I want to keep enjoying mm -hmm. the X. Yeah, because I think it's also an experience from the past. Like I knew. For a fact, when if I just pursue something without a goal, but like fulfilling my curiosity, it will lead to something. Um, yeah. In the end, like I'm, I think I'm kind of lucky because that that thing became a fact very early for me. Well, it's like this optimistic mindset sort of feeds upon itself. When good things happen, you expect good things to happen. Therefore, you engage yeah. with the world as if good things will happen. Yeah, absolutely. And then good things keep happening. Yeah, I think this is really underrated trait, honestly. I think there's a lot of miserable bastards on the internet. Like, no, no, no. Like, I, I feel like in, in Twitter, uh, especially like in people in our circle, I think there's a lot of optimistic people that is yeah. that do a That's lot of thinking. Yeah, yeah do, they do a lot of thinking about um, their life and like creating or building or even in a way some career path. But it's not that they just like autopilot through their career, but yeah. they really think about how to build the best and create a happy life. So yeah, I think that's interesting. I think a lot of people don't really understand, I will say especially people in Indonesia or Taiwan, they don't really realize that there's an option to be happy without keep pursuing career. I feel like even though you mentioned in America, just the script that you have to have a job, but at least from my interaction on Twitter, it already has this, or even Zoomers maybe, there's this conscience that, oh, I don't need to have like a fantastic career to be happy. I can just pursue my curiosity and I can make money. Yeah. I think this That's this a awareness. very Twitter bubble. Yeah, um, really. Yeah, I think there still is this pervasive um, career mindset in the U.S. I think one challenge in the U.S. is expectations are so extremely high. Um, people want the 3,000 square foot dream home, right? They want the nice cars. They want to put their kids in fancy schools. So, like, there's been a ratchet of, like, what people expect. Um, and people see other people doing that on social media and always feel like they're behind. Whereas, like, when I'm in Taiwan, like, I don't feel that pressure as much. I think I, part of it is, like, yeah, everyone lives in the same cities and has access to the same food, which is, like, reasonable priced. I think that phenomenon is also, um, I've, I've, told this, I've told you about this, but I've also found a similar phenomenon in Jakarta. In yeah. Indonesia, people just get influenced by uh, the social media of, oh, they have this, like, three-story houses. I have to, like, four-story houses kind of thing and I think it's because Jakarta is like growing up growing really fast right now developing really fast so it's kind of like a byproduct of that like um, keeping up with the Joneses yeah kind of thing and and I agree with you in Taiwan there's less of that kind of pressure I'm mean, just probably it there probably is but I can just be happy having a like okay house and then um, just spend my time in coffee shops and, and then do <laughs> yeah. work like if you've never been to Taipei, come here. There's a lot of tons of coffee shops here. Super yeah. great. Like, Do you think like you must get exposed to like a lot of Americans complaining about the country and the situation as well online? Like what what is your reaction when you see that kind of stuff? You shall see you shall see my list of like beauty Twitter words. <laughs> like <laughs> it's it, does insane. it shock you though? Like I think 
Um, from traveling and living in other countries, I think sometimes people don't understand the access to opportunities they have in the U.S. You mean for Americans? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I think a bit. Yes, I think a bit. Like some part of me, I'm not trying to trivialize some like social issue stuff, but some part of me kind of like see some Americans complaining about some very trivial bullshit. Like for me. Like for me, it's super trivial. It's like, why? Why are you doing? You know that this thing is like normal everywhere around the world, and not your, and not your country. And you know what I mean. So, like healthcare. Yeah, healthcare is a bit like I don't know, just right. I can't think about like, my mind's just like, how do you say culture war stuff? Oh yeah. I I mean I'm not gonna touch that in a ten foot pole. But like I think there part of this like, if that's your just. Again, not all of them. There are some social issues that I feel like it's really like some unique in the U.S. And I feel like this probably you guys have to deal with this shit kind of stuff. But there's some of them really like trivia, super trivial. Um, and I'm like, yeah, why why are you guys fighting about this right now? <laughs> kind of thing. So and you don't know you're having it really. You're having it really good up there. <laughs> and um, so it's like once you've met all your basic needs you you yeah. need to create drama in your yeah. life <laughs> that's true and again i'm not saying for people who really struggles i'm not saying that your your problems is not uh meaningful but i think in the grand scheme of things there are times where uh the people just don't they take a lot of stuff for granted i'll say that yeah in the u.s yeah yeah and i think I mean, I've experienced this, you've experienced this. Just living in other countries keeps resetting your expectations and it really has humbled me in terms of, like, a lot of your opportunities are so dependent on, like, where you're born or where you are or what you have access to. And I think you have a really good perspective on this. Like, growing up in Indonesia, people do not have great access to a global labor market or even things like travel, right? Because there are visa restrictions. You can't just travel to the U.S., for example. Yeah. You need a visa. Um, You know how hard it is to get a visa in the (laughs) the U.S. visa? Dang. I don't think people know. Yeah. Um, And despite that, you've sort of built this life engaging with the global world and tapping into the Internet and, like, taking such an optimistic mindset. I just think it's really inspiring. Yeah, I think... I think what I think about is like I know a lot of Taiwanese and Indonesians that are way smarter than me and can communicate better than me. But I I I don't think they're just not aware there's this opening that if you want to do it, you can collaborate with people around the world creating stuff you like. And not necessarily even in the context of creator economy, but really just finding a job that you like, you know. And there's a lot of great remote companies like Zapier, Buffer and whatnot so yeah i think we're very lucky like we live in the in the era where like the internet started to growing and then we kind of know our ways around that because if i had to do this like depends on my passport it's just it's not possible so when i said like the indonesian passport is like the travel equivalent of like a unicycle you technically can go anywhere with it <laughs> but like, god damn isn't it hard like <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> it should be this hard. Like, that's um, great. but yeah, um, I, that's something that I'm kind of want to um, tell people. It's possible that your opportunities are actually way more, um, are way more uh, diverse than just in the small island of Taiwan or the the island of Indonesia, um, and. Yeah, I think a lot of people understand that. Um, and it's probably a way, a mix of like they don't know how to reach out or they speak English, but they don't really understand how to communicate in, uh, in a non Taiwanese or an Indonesian, Indonesian way, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that's beautiful advice. Mm-hmm. Um, I love what you're up to. How can people support you, reach out, connect, uh, sign up for the Castro Pro subscription um, to, to keep Jovian working on Castro? 
um, how else can people support you or reach out? Right. So if you want to follow me um, personally, you can reach out to me or follow me on Twitter. It's Joe VN with three V's. It's J O V V V I A N. It's a random thing. I don't know. I didn't know I chose that name. Uh, yeah, J O V V V I N. Uh, follow me there or just uh, send me a DM or or hate mail if you want it. And if you want to try out Castro, if you want to try out Castro, go to the App Store and search for Castro or Castro Podcast Player. It's if you listen to tons of podcasts like what like Paul do, and Castro is the best for you because you don't you just need to su- subscribe and forget it. Only see your app if there's new episodes and yeah. That's it. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for coming on the Pathless Path. Thank you for inviting me, Mr. Miller. So, yeah. Awesome. Hey there. Thanks for watching that episode of the Pathless Path podcast in video form on YouTube. If you want to see more episodes, you can find links to further episodes up here, or you can subscribe over here. Thank you for your support, and I wish you luck on your own Pathless Path.